I did appreciate the opportunity to be away and uh, had an extra week to prepare for this sermon. Uh, if you notice the, the title today, the title of the sermon is, Are You Listening? Uh, there's some, some wonderful good news uh, in this scripture from Matthew 13. Uh, it is the beginning of Jesus teaching in parables. Uh, that was a, a common method of instruction for rabbis in those days. Uh, and to introduce his teaching about the parables, Jesus tells this parable and then explains later to the, uh, to the disciples why he teaches in parables. Uh, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there. So we have this picture of Jesus teaching and the crowd starts growing and growing until it's almost as if they're going to push him into the water. So he gets into a boat, sits, into the, sits in the boat, uh, and the whole crowd stood there on the beach. He told them many things in parables saying, listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. May God bless this reading of the scripture to our hearing and our understanding and the living of our faith. And if you would please join with me in the, uh, the, the prayer that I'm going to offer right now. Would you bow your heads? O oh Lord, now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Several years ago, a, a good friend of mine that uh, I had known as a colleague in ministry for many years uh, was facing what we called at that time burnout. He had been in the church he was serving for over 20 years. He was beloved by the members of the church. Some of them realized what was happening, and they suggested to him that he take some time off. Take as much time as you need. Get some rest, and you can come back refreshed. My friend told me that after several weeks away, and when he decided to come back at a time agreed upon with the church, he realized that it was time for him to hang up his spurs because even after several weeks away, he dreaded going back to the church. I will share this with you that uh, after only one Sunday away, it is good to be back with you this morning. Uh, I have no sense of dread at all. Our scripture lesson today was actually the lectionary reading for, for last Sunday. Uh, Reverend Zenobia chose to, to preach on the psalm, and uh, so I had the opportunity to preach on this scripture from Matthew. Jesus explained to the, to the disciples the reason he taught in parables. If we read between the lines, what Jesus is saying is this. In a parable, there is always the freedom to choose what you will, what the scripture says to you. It's not painted out in black and white. The parables are open-ended. It is up to the listener to decide what meaning does the parable have in their own life. The freedom to choose. With God, there is always the freedom to choose. We have the freedom to choose our belief about who God is. If we believe that God is some kind of mean judge just waiting to hit us with a hammer when we fall astray, God lets us choose that belief. 
If we believe that God is a gracious God just waiting to forgive us when we fall short, God gives us always, always the freedom to choose. Something interesting about the parable. I have told, told you before that the checklist I have of things I go through when I prepare for the sermon, the word Michel is on, on there. What does this have to do with how we live our lives on a daily basis, where the rubber meets the road? This parable spoke to the people of that time. Today, if I were to tell a similar parable, I would talk about a farmer who was farming several hundred acres. He had a combine that cost maybe $100,000, and he was able to go and harvest his, his crop no matter how many acres there were. Jesus is teaching the crowd, and it is almost as if he says, see over there? See that guy planting the seed, and they look on the hillside, and there's the farmer with a sack of grain over his shoulder, and he reaches into the sack and scatters the grain as he walks along. Maybe the, not the most efficient way of farming, but it's how farming was done back then. First lesson from the parable, God gives us good seed. Did you see the result, the yield of the crop? 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. I shared with James Howard recently that a friend of mine in, from Alva and I were visiting. It was after the wheat had been harvested uh, back in early June around Alva. Ron told me that some of the farmers in that area had told him their wheat crop made 60 bushels per acre. Now, you might not know just how stunning that is, but in western Oklahoma, in dry land farming, sometimes farmers are happy to get 15 or 20 bushels an acre. This year they had rain at just the right time with modern farming methods, all of the kinds of fertilizers, weed killers, bug killers. They had a crop of 60 bushels per acre. God gives us good seed to sow. We call this good seed good news, the literal meaning of the word evangel, from which we get our word evangelism, Good news. Evangelism is sharing good news. The purpose of the church is to increase the love of God and neighbor. We do this through evangelism. Now, evangelism doesn't have to be the kind of dirty word that we think of it sometimes. We have a group that's meeting on Wednesday night now to come together and just enjoy each other's company. That can be a form of evangelism if we reach out to those who are outside the church. When we pass out the snack packs down here on Monday and Wednesday and Friday morning, that is a form of evangelism. It's sharing good news. When you are speaking with a friend or a neighbor and say, have you been to church in a while? Do you have a church home? I want to invite you to my church. That is one-on-one -on -one evangelism, sharing the faith. Evangelism is the main thing. The main thing is the main thing. Let the church never make secondary what Christ made primary. We are called always to share our faith. True story about listening, which I believe is another important lesson in this parable. Jesus starts and ends this parable with the words, listen, and he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I'm going to call them Jack and Jill. Obviously, that's not their real names. But 
Jill was concerned her husband of over 40 years had developed some hearing deficiency and he wanted, she wanted him to have his hearing tested. Jill knew that our son Jace is a, a well-known audiologist and she asked if, if Jack could have an appointment with Jace and so I called Jace and they set up an appointment. Jace tested Jack's hearing and it turned out he had perfect hearing. Let that sink in for a second. It was selective deafness. Jack chose not to hear when Jill nagged or whatever at him. His, his hearing was perfect. How is your hearing? How is your listening? James said, be quick to listen and slow to speak. In all of my years of schooling, and I had never really sat down and figured that out until this past week, I started school when President Eisenhower was in office, and I finished when Bush 41 was in office. Uh, that's quite a span of years if you add it up. And I didn't even go to kindergarten. Back then in Oklahoma, Oklahoma didn't have required kindergarten. But from elementary school, junior high school, high school, college, graduate school, postgraduate work, I was in school for almost 40 years. Of all of the courses that I took, especially in seminary, Old Testament, New Testament, church administration, preaching, one course was better than all of the others. When I was doing some doctoral work, I took a, call, a course called CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education. In that course, we were taught much about counseling situations, and one of the things we were required to do was to turn in verbatims from when we had counseled persons. If you ever see on television or in a movie a patient who is visiting a psychologist or a psychiatrist, often the psychologist or psychiatrist will have a notepad and, and they're taking notes during the counseling session. That is because afterwards they will go through those notes and print out as much as they can remember from what they have written down a verbatim of what the patient has said. It is training to be a good listener of all the courses in school, from grade school through postgraduate work. The course that helped me the most was the course that taught me how to be a good listener. Paul Tillich said the first duty of love is to listen. Are you listening? Are you listening to those who are closest to you, family, friends? Have you ever been visiting with someone and as you're visiting, you're speaking and you can see them start to take a breath. They're just waiting to say something as soon as you stop speaking. Are you a good listener for those who are closest to you? Are you a good listener to others who are in need? There is a song called People, Call, People Need the Lord. The writer of that song says, on they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. The songwriter is wrong. We can be a good listener. We can hear their silent cries if we listen not only with our ears, but also with our heart. 
Are you listening to God? When you pray to God, is your prayer more a prayer of telling God what you want, what God needs to do? Or do you spend at least as much time in prayer listening for what God needs you to do? True story, when I learned an important lesson about listening not only with the ears, but with the heart. In the church I served, one of the members was a car dealer. He would invite anyone he could think of to church. One day he came to me and said, Kip, I met a guy that needs to be in church. They don't attend church now, but they need to be in church. He gave me their name and their address, and so I went to visit them. I'll, I'll call them Ralph and Sandra because that was their real name. I drove down the street looking for the address, saw the house, middle-class neighborhood, middle-class house, neat, lawn was mowed, walked up to the front door. As I walked up the steps on the porch, I could hear Ralph and Sandra hollering at each other. Hurtful words, hateful words, shameful words, cussing each other. Now, if you had been in my place, would you have gone ahead and knocked on the door and say, here, I'm, I'm here from the church, I want to invite you to church? Or would you have turned around and walked away and decided it might be better to come back another time? If we listen closely, we can understand that what anyone says does not define them in only one day of their lives. What I will always remember is this. I did go back another time and invite Ralph and Sandra to church. Sandra transferred her membership from another church. Ralph had never been baptized. I was able to baptize him. When we moved from that place to the next church that we served, we still received church newspapers from that church. That next summer, I noticed when the directors for Vacation Bible School were listed, Sandra was one of the directors of Vacation Bible School. When we listen, when we listen not only with our ears, but with our hearts. We might think the scripture, Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has a heart to hear, let him hear. It is my prayer for each of you that someday the living Christ will point you out to a crowd and say, listen, a Christian went out not to sow, but a Christian went out to listen. A Christian, because they listened, went out to love. Amen.